Do not arouse the wrath of the great and powerful Oz. I said come back tomorrow. Do you presume to criticize the great Oz? You ungrateful creatures think yourselves lucky that I'm giving you audience tomorrow instead of 20 years from now. The great Oz has spoken. Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. The American Revolutionary War began in 1775 as the American colonies sought to detach from England and its oppressive monarchy. The two major reasons which brought about the American Revolution, first of all, taxation without representation, such as the Stamp Act and the tax on tea, but the primary reason, the colonies established their own currency, they printed their own money, and it was being used in commerce without interest. So in return, King George III of England outlawed it. He forced the colonies to borrow money from the Bank of England at interest, which immediately put the colonies into debt. Benjamin Franklin wrote, England took away from the colonies their money, which created unemployment. The inability of the colonists to get power to issue their own money permanently out of the hands of George III and the international bankers was the prime reason for the Revolutionary War. In 1783, America won its independence over England. However, the central bank model and the corrupt greed concept associated with it had just begun. So what is a central bank? The central bank is an institution that produces a currency for an entire country. Two powers are inherent in central banking practices. Number one, they control the interest rates, and number two, they control the money supply and inflation. The central bank does not print the money supply and hand it over to the country. Instead, the central bank prints the money and loans it to the country at interest. Then through increasing and decreasing the money supply, the central bank regulates the value of the currency being issued. It is critical to understand that the long-term product of the central banking system is debt. It doesn't take a genius to figure out this Ponzi scheme. First of all, the United States does not print or own any of these Federal Reserve notes you may have in your wallet. Every single dollar printed is loaned to us at interest. This means that every single dollar printed already has a certain percentage of debt attached to it. Since the central bank has a monopoly on the production of the currency being issued and they loan each dollar with immediate debt attached to it, where does the money come from to pay off the debt? The answer is simple. It can only come from the central bank. They just print more money. So let me give you an example. If a president wants to stimulate the economy by infusing $700 billion into the economy, or he wants to pay $800 billion for a universal health care system, well, the president can't reach into the congressional pocketbook because they are already in debt over their heads. So instead, they request that the Federal Reserve print the 700 or $800 billion they need. But the Federal Reserve doesn't just print the money free of charge. Instead, they add on or print extra to cover the percentage for services rendered, and they pocket the excess. Regardless of whatever is written in code, the Federal Reserve really has no oversight, and they are not really bound by a checks and balance system like the three branches of our government. So without audits, it's impossible to know how much the Federal Reserve is actually printing, who they are loaning it to, and any potential conflicts of interest. Henry Ford said about the Federal Reserve, It is well that the people of the nation do not understand our banking and monetary system. For if they did, I believe there would be a revolution before tomorrow morning. So let's get back and look at the circumstances that led to the creation of the Federal Reserve. By the early 20th century, the U.S. had already implemented and removed a few private bank systems, which were swindled into place by ruthless banking interests. At this time, the dominant families in the banking corporate worlds were the Rockefellers, the Morgans, the Warburgs, and the Rothschilds. In the early 1900s, they sought again to publish legislation to create another central bank. However, they knew the government and the public were wary of such institutions, so they needed to create an incident to affect public opinion. In 1907, 
J.P. Morgan published rumors that the Knickerbocker Trust Company was insolvent. This was a deliberate act of market manipulation which precipitated the panic of 1907. This led to an eruption of bankruptcies, repossessions, and failures. Unaware of the fraud, the panic led to a congressional investigation headed by Senator Nelson Aldrich. Aldrich had intimate ties to the banking cartels, and he was the insider the banking cartels desperately needed. The commission led by Aldrich recommended a central bank should be implemented so the panic of 1907 would never happen again. This was the jumpstart the international bankers needed. In 1910, a secret meeting was held at the J.P. Morgan estate on Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia. It was there that the central banking bill, called the Federal Reserve Act, was drafted. The bill was written by bankers for bankers. The meeting was held in complete secrecy. After the bill was constructed, it was then handed to their political spokesperson, Senator Nelson Ulrich, and he pushed it through Congress. And in 1913, with heavy sponsorship by the bankers, Woodrow Wilson became president, having already agreed to sign the Federal Reserve Act in exchange for campaign support. And two days before Christmas, while the majority of Congress was away for the holidays, the Federal Reserve Act was voted in and President Wilson signed it into law. The public was told that the Federal Reserve System would give them financial stability and inflation and economic crises would become a thing of the past. As history has shown, nothing could be further from the truth. The fact is, the international bankers now had a streamlined machine to carry out their private agendas. For example, between 1914 and 1919, the Fed doubled the money supply, which led to extensive loans to small businesses and the public. Then in 1920, the Fed called in the remaining outstanding money supply, which resulted in panic and loans being called in. This led to bank runs and bank failures. Over 5,400 competitive banks, not within the Federal Reserve banking system, collapsed. The Fed sucked these banks up in a hurry, furthering their sphere of influence and power. Charles Lindbergh had stepped up and said after the creation of the Federal Reserve, from now on, Depressions will be scientifically created, and as we shall see, this statement was more prophetic than arbitrary. Now the big bankers were just getting warmed up, and they had a bigger plan to unveil on the American people. Between 1921 and 1929, the Fed again increased the money supply by over 60 percent, which once again led to extensive loans to the public, companies, and banks. There was also a new concept called a margin loan in the stock market. Very simply, a margin loan would allow an investor to buy a stock with only 10% down. The remainder of the stock would be carried by the broker. In other words, I could buy $1,000 worth of stock with only $100 down. This was very popular during the Roaring Twenties, and everyone seemed to be making money, lots of money. However, there was a catch to this loan. When the stock dips below a certain level, the balance could be called in and must be paid within 24 hours. This is called a margin call, which usually resulted in the selling of the stock to cover the outstanding loan. And whatever the investor had put into the market was lost if he or she could not meet the margin. So a few months before October in 1929, J.D. Rockefeller and the other banking insiders quietly exited the market. And on October 24, 1929, the New York financiers who furnished the margin loans started calling them in. This sparked an instant massive sell-off in the market, for everyone had to cover the margin loans. It caused runs on banks, which caused the collapse of over 16,000 banks. These international bankers were not only able to suck up these independent rival banks, but also whole corporations for pennies on the dollars. It was the biggest robbery in U.S. history. We have in this country one of the most corrupt institutions the world has ever known. I refer to the Federal Reserve Board and the Federal Reserve Banks, here and after called the Fed. They are not government institutions. They are private monopolies which prey upon the people of the United States for the benefit of themselves and their foreign customers.
It didn't stop there. Instead of expanding the money supply, the Fed actually contracted the money supply, fueling the largest depression in U.S. history. Once again outraged by the acts of the Fed, Lewis McFadden brought about impeachment hearings against President Herbert Hoover, and he also introduced a resolution bringing conspiracy charges against the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve, saying that the crash of 1929 and the following depression was a carefully contrived occurrence. Are you going to let these thieves get off scot-free? Is there one law for the looter who drives up to the door of the United States Treasury in his limousine and another for the United States veterans who are sleeping on the floor of a dilapidated house on the outskirts of Washington? Not surprising, after two failed attempts, Lewis McFadden was assassinated by means of poisoning at a banquet in 1936. So having reduced the society to squalor, the Federal Reserve decided it was time to strip the people of all the remaining wealth. So under the pretense of ending the Depression came the 1933 gold seizure. Under the threat of imprisonment for 10 years, everyone in the United States had to turn in their gold coins, bullion, and gold certificates. And by the end of 1933, the gold standard was abolished and the people received a Federal Reserve note which is not backed by anything. Before 1933, the dollar stated it was redeemable in gold. After 1933, it is just legal tender. It is worthless paper. The only thing that gives it value is the amount of notes in circulation. The power to regulate the money supply is also the power to regulate its value, which is also the power that can bring entire economies and societies to its knees. Give me the control of a nation's money supply, and I care not who makes its laws. Title 31 of the U.S. Code requires an annual physical inventory of our gold supply, but a complete audit was never done. So officially, nobody knows what has occurred for the last decades. After World War II, America had 70% of the world's supply of loose gold, but today we may have less than 7%. Senator Jesse Helms seemed to think that OPEC nations have our gold, while others believe that 70% of the world's gold supply is being held by the World Bank, which is dominated by the financial grip of the Rothschilds and Rockefellers. The Federal Reserve System has never been audited, and their meetings and minutes of those meetings are not open to the public. They have repelled all attempts to be audited. Arthur Burns, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, said that an audit would threaten the independence of the Reserve. Once again, it is important to understand that the Federal Reserve is a private institution. As the well-known saying goes, it is as federal as Federal Express. It is a private bank that loans us a currency at interest. It is completely consistent with the banking model our founding fathers escaped from by declaring independence in the American Revolutionary War. I believe the banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties than standing armies. Already they have raised up a moneyed aristocracy that has set the government at defiance. The issuing power should be taken away from the banks and restored to the people to whom it properly belongs. Thomas Jefferson the controlling of the money supply and the economy is only a portion of the power the international bankers wield against us. The next tool for profit and control is war. Since the inception of the Federal Reserve in 1913, it seems as if we have been in a perpetual war at one place or another. There's a reason for this. It's important to understand that the most lucrative thing that can happen for the international bankers is war for it forces the country to borrow even more money from the Federal Reserve Bank at interest. Not only that, but they have heavy investments in the weapons manufacturers. We are going to take a look at this in depth in the next video. Our country, founded on the principle of freedom and civil rights, has slowly evolved as the deadliest beast system the horror of revelation has ever sought to control. May God continue to bless and guide your studies.